Yeah. Yes, go ahead. That's a very complicated question, and I'll just try, try to be as brief as I can. The evangelicalism I grew up in, and I think I know very well, not only from growing up in it, but studying it, and I, I still think it exists as an ethos among many denominations, would not be that attractive or popular to many people. I think that the American nationalistic conservative, fundamentalist, evangelicalism, the media portrays uh, is just very attractive to a lot of people because rah, rah, America, American exceptionalism, and that's kind of at the center of it, it seems like. In fact, I, I haven't taken a poll, but I think a lot of people have joined what they think are evangelical churches because of that attraction, because those churches, for example, promote American nationalism, which they want. They, they want a support group of people who think like they do. But I'm, I'm not convinced those churches are necessarily what I mean by evangelical. So I think there's a disconnect between what those of us who are scholars of evangelicalism think it means and what the media and many people who think they're evangelicals think it means. So the evangelicalism I was describing and that I grew up in was high demand. And it was not particularly political. Um, it wasn't aligned with any particular political agenda or platform. We were anti-communist, okay. But we were not necessarily Democrats or Republicans. In fact, the one I grew up in, for the most part, people didn't vote at all. So. You know, I don't know how to answer the question beyond that, except to say I don't, I think it would be totally different. Real evangelicalism, if I can put it that way, does not exist on the scope that people think. Go ahead. I'd be interested if any of you who are not named Brad Gregory <laughs> I've been summoned, <laughs> I guess because I name dropped. Um, so I guess I'll name the part that I would respond to because there's a lot there and I'm not going to respond to all of it. Um, but the, the, there's the, well, there's two things, right? There's the argument about intention and unintentionality, which I think is right on. Um, I think it's extremely worthwhile and valuable to look at, to, to separate out the, what, you can, what you can possibly track of a theological intention based upon its initial reception, based upon the correspondence of the authors writing it, et cetera, et cetera, and then the reverberations that the historical record shows beyond doubt were already trying to be controlled by the reformers in the 16th century. And it's, a, it's an incredible gift um, to all of us to, to do that you know, comprehensive work of tracing out that fragmentation. Um, the other side um, of the story that I think I would, you know, that I see my work in some ways responding to and adding to is to ask the question of, okay, we've lost um, a, a sense of religion that is integrated into society in all the ways that Professor Gregory discusses, um, and religion has become this sort of separated category um, that 
is operationalized, I think in the ways that I'm trying to give an account of, to create space for the operation of other kinds of economies and other kinds of political discourse to purport to bring people together in a way that religion apparently failed to do due to these complicated resources. And then there's the question of, are those processes in contemporary society having to do with, you know, let's say just economics and politics for now, um, are those operating according to sort of religious, uh, using religious strategies to carry out their ends? So that's the question where I think we've got this account of how religion was, pre was fabricated in, in the aftermath of the reformations in order to potentially solve this fragmentation problem. But now we've got something that I think it goes along to the evangelical question too, right? That you've got this kind of uh, identity of evangelicals that doesn't match up to what you see on the ground um, in certain communities, that doesn't match up to the complicated histories. And then how do you retell that story and reintegrate something that in practice often isn't as separated as we would think? So, so where is religion now? Is religion, is neoliberalism a religion? I mean, there's a lot of ways in which it is. Is, uh, is American nationalism a religion? There's a lot of ways in which it is. So I think that the thesis that, uh, that Professor Gregory forwards uh, puts that question front and center and gives us all more work to do. Yeah, yeah go ahead, Carol. Well, I'm, I'm in full agreement with uh, Brad's argument about the isolation of religion as a development, a very slow, gradual development, very complicated, not even everywhere, very much so. Um, I'm also reminded of the fact that in the Reformation era, in the Catholic world, when someone was referred to as a religious, that meant a monastic, because there was also this conflict viewed as eternal until the apocalypse uh, between the world and the church. So in that sense, religion was compartmentalized, right? But what happens in the modern world is that religion is, in fact, set aside as a different category so that people can pursue, as I've been saying for years, business as usual. And it's no accident that the first iconoclasts who start selling the images to Catholics are the Dutch. <laughs> they actually figure we can make a profit. If, if we don't destroy these things, but we sell them to Catholics, they're going to hell anyway. So, you know, let's give them their idols. Uh, and, and today I had kind of an epiphany, I must say, which is um, that how do you get to that point? And why is it that the Dutch are really the first? Why? Why are they the first? And why is it, I was trying to think, I was going through the list, are there any Catholic countries, even including France, where you've got lots of Protestants, where you get the kind of full toleration? Because in France, the Huguenots were only grudgingly tolerated, and they're eventually uh, chased out. So why? why, what's going on with the Dutch? So the epiphany I had was that in fact, you have to think of religion as that interior thing that interior thing and that it's, it's in some way separate from that world. Yes, the world is always in conflict with Christians, but in fact, um, that this worldliness that Weber speaks about has to be in place in order for the Dutch to allow the Catholics to hold their masses in people's homes. And go, you have to go in through the back door, though. You have to go in through the back door, but they'll grudgingly tolerate just about anyone, uh, including Spinoza. <laughs> so uh, how does that happen? How do people become tolerant? You know, I think the economic argument uh, is a strong one, very strong, that people want to do business. There's a novel, A uh, Girl with a Pearl Earring, set in Delft, that shows very, very graphically. That's why I love fiction. I love historic, good historical fiction. How Catholics and Protestants lived in the same tight, cramped space and had to negotiate their daily lives and do business. Uh, but that's not the sole uh, causality there, the economic one. I think there's also the ideological one, the belief 
that uh, you can, in fact, compartmentalize because the world, the Calvinist viewpoint, the world is fallen. And the divine and supernatural is a separate realm, even as, as much as the world is the theater of God's glory. Calvin says, at any moment, any tile on any roof can kill you. <laughs> it's not, uh, the world is the world. That's all I'm talking about. I'm tempted to end with that thought because it's such a terrible one, but I, we, we have time for more questions. Go ahead. Well, if there is time, um, we have a challenges and the benefits of one of the three large families of Christianity not having experienced Anybody? In my experience, they're attracting a lot of younger people who just don't want to mess with all this who want to go to something ancient and not have to deal with these issues of modernism versus fundamentalism versus this and that. And uh, evangelicals have lost a lot of people over the last 30 years to Eastern Orthodoxy. Uh, I'm, I'm absolutely not a scholar of uh, the Orthodox traditions at all, but I, but I, but I have some Orthodox friends. Um, <laughs> my experience has been both of um, Protestants, whether evangelicals or others who came from uh, another Protestant tradition, or Catholics who end up being attracted to, and in some cases, becoming Orthodox. They tend to be drawn toward a high liturgical tradition. They, um, it, it gives you a high, a high liturgical tradition while avoiding the kinds of questions that are embedded in being Catholic in the West, relationship between religion and power, institutions, and so forth, because Eastern Orthodoxy really isn't a part of that history. Yes, it impinges on, in Eastern Europe and so, and so forth, but it really is not a part of the last 500 years in a, in a substantive and transformative way, the way that, that Roman Catholicism is. So if you're attracted to a high liturgical tradition, you're attracted to mysticism, for example, certain kinds of prayer, emphasis on um, emphasis on the Greek church fathers rather than Augustine. I mean, as my friend David Bentley Hart, I mean, I think probably the best Anglophone Orthodox theologian in the world right now says, what's the difference between Orthodoxy and the Latin tradition? Augustine. I mean, it's the lack of Augustine and the incredibly powerful influence that Augustine exerts, not only, of course, on the Reformed and, and Lutheran traditions, but on Roman Catholicism. Augustine is far and away the single most important church father in the Latin Middle Ages. So if you want to get away from Augustine, and you know some parts of Augustine, maybe Compelli and Trare, maybe a little bit some things people don't like so much, and you, you're more inclined toward the Greek, the patristic notion in the, in the Greek church fathers, in the Cappadocian fathers about gradual divinization, about the way, if you're attracted to origin, possibly, right, universal salvation. Very, very different than the, the tone of a, a strongly Augustinian uh, inf inflected Christianity. So it seems to me that's part, of the, that's part of the attraction that a lot of people that are drawn toward orthodoxy feel. But that's just, really all. Can I take a stab at that too? Okay. <laughs> I didn't know nothing about orthodoxy. <laughs> I'm also not a scholar of orthodoxy. I'm also not a theologian. So my take on that is actually more cultural and social. Um, and very anecdotal, but um, I mean, I, I, I do, uh, I have seen friends, Catholic friends and other friends who are drawn to the high church liturgy, to the iconography, to sort of the aesthetic. There's an aesthetics to orthodoxy, which is quite different. That said, 
we also can't romanticize the unity of orthodoxy. I was at a conference several years ago, I was invited to a conference where the Greek Orthodox folks and the Russian Orthodox people were at each other's throats the entire time. So there's something, there's some history there about the formation of those identities, those national identities, and the way that that has played into the Orthodox tradition that's yeah, probably many people have explored it, and I just don't, I haven't read the books, but it's, there's another, there are other arguments. Let's just put it that way. All right. Well, as you can see, part of being an academic is to speak not only on what you know, but on what you don't know. <laughs> we are all so willing to do it. Like your Luther book. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you all for being here, and a round of applause one more time. Maybe.